good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second digital history seminar this year. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Lee tonight, who will be speaking to us about reimagining digitized newspapers with machine learning. And for those of you who attend regularly or have been coming for a while on and off, you'll be aware that we actually, uh, on a quite a regular basis, have discussed research projects and papers that were based on using historical newspapers um, and looking at collections such as the British Library ones, American, Australian collections and so on. And we discussed in previous seminars the vast and varied collections and also implications of archiving practices. Start again. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second digital history seminar series this year. It's my pleasure to introduce Ben Lee, who will be speaking to us about reimagining digitized newspapers with machine learning. So for those of you who've been coming regularly or have been coming over the past years on and off, you will know that we often covered research projects and papers <clears throat> in the seminar series that deal with historical newspapers and collections. Um, so we spent kind of quite a lot of time discussing the implications of archiving practices and the way in which newspapers have been made commercially available or publicly available. And in most of the seminars, we primarily focused on newspapers as text, right? Because we looked at how these newspapers give us insights or give um, answers to historians about um, certain issues using words and discussing newspapers as text. Um, I'm thrilled, therefore, that tonight's seminar will shift the focus onto something else, um, because Ben is in a great position to speak to us uh, about this, as he, he has been creating, actually, a tool, the Newspaper Navigator, that facilitates um, access to the visual content of, of newspapers, specifically the chronicling American data set. So he will talk to us about this tonight. Um, just by words of introduction, Ben is a fourth year PhD candidate uh, at the University of Washington, where he studies human AI interaction. But he was also a 2020 innovator in residence at the Library of Congress, where he created the newspaper Navigator that he's going to talk about. He also served as the 2020 21 uh, Memorial Fellow in the Straum Center for Jewish Studies at the Universities of Washington. Um, he's been a visiting fellow in Harvard's history department after his graduation from Harvard, and he's currently a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow in machine learning. So he's had a busy four years, um, as I imagine, and we're very fortunate to have him here tonight to talk about his ideas about reimagining digitized newspapers with machine learning. Thank you, Ben. Over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much for the uh, introduction, Tessa, and for all the assistance, Melody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today at the uh, IHR Digital History Seminar Series. Um, I'm honored to be here. My name is Ben, and today I'll be talking about Newspaper Navigator, Reimagining Digitized Newspapers with Machine Learning. Uh, before I get underway, I do want to say um, that this work is very much in collaboration with the Library of Congress, as, um, as Tessa had mentioned, through the Innovator in Residence program. And so I just wanted to thank LC Labs, in particular, as well as the National Digital Newspaper Program and IT Design and Development at the library um, for all their assistance with getting this project underway, as well as my advisor, Dan Weld at the University of Washington. So with that, let me go ahead and just give a, a quick outline of what the next 40 minutes or so will look like. My plan is to um, start with an introduction to Newspaper Navigator through the lens of the data set. Then I'll turn to the search application that we released for the project. And so um, I'll give a live demo then I'll turn to the data set and search application usage that we've seen thus far. I'll move toward, um, at this point, pivoting more toward a critical socio-technical lens for the project and talk about this data archaeology that I wrote. And then lastly, we'll broaden the scope and talk about Newspaper Navigator through the lens of computer science and the digital humanities. I think move this more downstream into sort of canonical digital history type research. And with that, we'll turn it over to questions. So I like to motivate Newspaper Navigator through Chronicling America, which as Tesla had mentioned is a, you know, an American collection of newspapers. In particular, it's a database of now over 18 million pages of digitized historic um, newspapers from across the United States. 
Um, generally speaking, this content is contributed by libraries and other donors across states and territories. And it's all run by what is known as the National Digital Newspaper Program. I'll be calling it NDNP for short, which effectively is a partnership between the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress. Um, and handles effectively all the funding and infrastructural support to be able to make the collection publicly available. Along those lines, the collection is fully in the public domain, which makes it, I think, a rare, but uh, you know, obviously very important um, uh, collection in this regard and has seen reuse across a number of different um, uh, areas. Um, along those lines, Chronicling America also supports full API and bulk data access. And I mentioned this not only for those of you who are interested in computing against a newspaper collection, but also because this kind of infrastructural support was really essential in making Newspaper Navigator possible. So I have uh, the NDNP to, to credit here, definitely. In terms of the broad contours of the collection, I'm just going to go through a few slides just to give us a sense of what it uh, sort of comprises. So here is a choropleth map showing the number of uh, pages in Chronicling America um, by state as of April of 2020, when there were about 16 million pages. And so at the time, 47 states plus Washington DC and Puerto Rico were covered with additional states and territories along the way. Um, and here is a county level map. I like this one for a couple of reasons. One, I think it shows just how local many of the papers in Chronicling America are. And moreover, I like it because I think it gives a sense of just how much of the United States is covered in one way, shape or form by Chronicling America. It's fun to try to find a county that isn't covered. Um, in terms of the temporal coverage, um, at the time of April 2020, it spanned um, 1789 to 1963. As we can see, the really critical mass of the collection is from about 1875 to 1925. Um, and that rather precipitous drop off that we see is uh, just due to US copyright law and what is or considered automatically in the public domain as of that boundary of 1923. Um, in terms of pre-1875 pages, for example, though, we still see over a million of them. And um, this gives us a sense that we can really start to study you know, pretty much any period of American history post 1789 using Chronicling America as a primary source. Um, in terms of other ways in which I think the, the collection is diverse, here is a visualization made by uh, my colleague uh, Nathan Yarosavage of the NDNP team. And I like this uh, visualization because it shows um, the number of non-English pages in the collection. And I think it begins to give us a sense of the heterogeneity of the collection. With that though, I think it's probably best to turn to the actual newspapers pages themselves. And so if you visit the portal at chroniclingamerica.lock.gov, you'll find uh, a number of front pages from 100 years ago. And so here are a couple that I, uh, that I picked um, one, uh, one day. And um, I like this because we can start to get a sense of the kind of data that Chronicling America actually provides. So first and foremost, we have, of course, the high resolution scan, typically digitized off of microfilm. And so we can download this in a number of formats. But then we also have the underlying optical character recognition or OCR representation. For those of you who aren't familiar, I'm sure many of you are, OCR just refers to a machine learning algorithm that takes in a scan of a document and learns how to convert the, the pixelated letters to actual uh, text file, um, making it uh, keyword searchable. In the case of uh, the OCR for Chronicling America, it's not actually just a, a raw transcription, but these trans the letters are actually localized on the pl image plane. So what this means is if I do a keyword search against a newspaper page, we'll not only find certain pages that contain that keyword, but we'll actually see the word highlighted in context as shown on the page pages right now. And I raise this because it's actually an important part of the newspaper navigator workflow. But I think OCR is a really it's a good analogy to motivate the kind of question that I'm interested in with Newspaper Navigator, in particular because uh, OCR really unlocks newspapers in terms of our ability to search over them. Um, of course, metadata and facets are incredibly valuable, but really having keyword search is, uh, you know, just unlocks the collection in new ways. And so I think if there's one way to frame Newspaper Navigator, it's through this lens of how can we do something analogous, but for the visual content on the newspaper page. And so I'd like to really motivate uh, Newspaper Navigator through the project that Newspaper Navigator built directly on top of, but also I think really I was inspired by, and this is a crowdsourcing initiative called Beyond Words. And so this was launched by the LC Labs team in 2017. Um, it was actually the staff innovator in residence project of Tong Wong. And um, Beyond Words, I think is uh, really exciting. It asks volunteers to draw bounty boxes around visual content with the idea being that this kind of activity is actually a great way of bringing people to Chronicling America. And so in particular, volunteers were asked to do uh, three different steps. There was this mark step where they draw bounding boxes around 
five different types of visual content as shown here. Uh, a second transcribe step where they would note down the caption, um, indicate the artist, uh, indicate the category, and then a third sort of verify step just for quality assurance purposes. Um, I do want to mention one particular um, element of the workflow that is you know, particularly clever, which is that um, in the, the mark step, volunteers were asked to draw bounding boxes to include all of the relevant textual content. Then in the second transcribe step, the system would actually pre-populate the caption with all of the OCR falling within that bounding box. If we recall, OCR is localized on the image, so we actually know all of the text falling within a specific box. And the idea here is it's faster to transcribe you know, dirty or messy OCR um, than it is to start transcribing from scratch. Um, I do want to also mention that uh, Beyond Words has been really just uh, immensely successful. It accrued thousands of annotations over the time that it was uh, launched and it reached a wide number of user groups. And I think as a crowdsourcing project by all metrics was wildly successful. I encountered the project soon after it launched and was really taken by this, this visual content. Um, so here's uh, a sampling of some of the visual content identified by volunteers. Um, I put together this collage just because I think it begins to give us a sense of the ways in which newspaper pages are, as Tessa said, not just textual sources. There are these, these that you know, incorporate this really, really rich visual culture. And just looking at the small sampling, I think we could begin to start to understand some of the questions that we might begin to ask as historians or other user groups as well. And so when uh, the Library of Congress uh, announced their call for innovator and residence uh, concept papers, my mind really jumped to Beyond Words, not only because I was taken by the visual content and by you know, the number of uh, visual content elements that had been identified, but moreover, because coming from a machine learning background, I began to wonder if this really rich data set that had come out of the project could be used in some way as some sort of uh, training data set for a machine learning model to try to then automate this at the scale of all of Chronicling America. And so the way that I like to phrase this through the language of the, the LC's digital strategy was, you know, can we quote unquote throw open this treasure chest of Chronicling America by training a machine learning algorithm to process it at scale? And so this would uh, comprise the first step of Chronicling America, or excuse me, a newspaper navigator. The second phase would then be reimagining how we search over it. And then subsequently thinking about these kinds of downstream, um, you know, digital history collaborations that I'll speak about. But um, I want to mention, you know, in terms of the project sort of meta goals that we laid out at the very beginning when this um, really went underway in September 2019, so just about two years ago, um, was one to think about facilitating interdisciplinary research, not just in you know, my home discipline of computer science, but really taking a broader view of library and information science, the digital humanities in, in general, and in particular, the digital history. Um, and then also, per the Library of Congress's mission, not just thinking about scholarship from an academic perspective, but also really trying to engage the public and think about creative computing projects, how we could support that and engage the public through this rich visual content. So similar to Beyond Words in that nature. So let me give an idea of this first part of the project, which was given a couple of newspaper pages, like the ones that we see. I picked these because these are from the day after D-Day. And so as we see on the left, there's some you know, striking visual content that we would expect to see. Hopefully if we could feed this into a machine learning model, the idea was, we'd like to be able to get back bounding boxes, showing us not just where the visual content is, but classifying it according to some categories. So this includes photos, illustrations, comics, editorial cartoons, and maps, which are the five beyond words categories that we already had a number of labels for. But then also two additional categories, headlines and advertisements, with the idea being that these are also useful and I could just effectively provide some annotations going over the beyond words page on my own. And so then once we have these bounding boxes, we can use that trick from beyond words, go into the underlying OCR, and then extract effectively captions for all the visual content. In the case of the headlines, this would give us a transcription directly. And of course, this is certainly not a perfect process. OCR is never perfect. Moreover, the bounding boxes might include extraneous content or exclude relevant content. But this at least gives us a way of sort of bootstrapping ourselves up to having at least some more metadata about the images. So then now that we have captions, we sort of have a, a broader view of the visual content. So let me talk very briefly about what this looks like in terms of training the model to do this. So I ended up using Detectron 2, which is uh, Facebook AI Research's sort of open source object detection library. And so I do wanna preface this by saying that if anything that I say sounds you know, too technical or anything in the questions phase, I'm happy to unpack this or go into a bit more of the intuition. But here the idea was, to utilize the sort of general machine learning framework of pre-training and fine-tuning. And so here, 
Um, Detectron 2 provides what's called a model zoo. And here I took one of their uh, architectures or backbones called Faster RCNN, which has already been trained on a massive object detection data set known in co as Common Objects in Context or COCO for short. And so what this means is that, uh, you know, the research team had already taken care of doing this training at scale, um, making sure it was performing well, and then we can effectively just download the model. Then we can train it some more on the Beyond Words annotations, plus these additional annotations of headlines and ads. But the idea being that training some more on a task specific objective or a relevant data set known as quote unquote fine tuning in this context can actually lead to not only higher performance, but it's also just a more efficient way of doing this as opposed to starting from scratch. So I do just want to give some intuition for those who might not be familiar with object detection. So the task of object detection in computer vision refers to given an image, um, uh, having a machine learning model generate output in the form of bounding boxes, showing where uh, visual, uh, certain objects, quote unquote, are appearing on the page. And so here we see an example of an image that's been fed into a, an object detection algorithm that then outputs a bounding box around the dog, around the bike, around the truck, showing not only that they're in the image, but where they are. And in effect, there is this you know, pretty natural resonance between this task on the left and then the idea on the right of drawing a bounding box, say, around an advertisement or a cartoon on the newspaper page. And so by training some more on the Beyond Words annotations, we're effectively leveraging the, the model that already knows how to do the task on the left in order to do what we're interested in on the right. Once we have this model, of course, we can then feed in Chronicling America pages and get back out predictions. Um, so I have some statistics on the training or validation set, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna move forward and talk about what training this looks like in practice. So in total, I fine tuned for 77 epochs with early stopping. This is a bit technical, but the, the bottom line is this took a little less than a day on a single GPU. So in terms of time and in cost, this was pretty efficient. We're talking tens of US dollars. Um, here are some of the hyperparameters, um, but I do wanna mention as some pointers, in the GitHub repo for the project, you'll find a demo for training this model in case you're interested in fine tuning one for your own project. Um, you'll find the actual model weights themselves. You'll find instructions for using these models in your own project. I um, mean, also, I'm happy to say that the model weights are now incorporated into Layout Parser, which is a new Python library for um, deep learning based document layout analysis. And so you can actually use the model in just a couple of lines of code. In terms of the performance of the model, um, here I'm reporting what's known as average precision, tends to be an overloaded term in the machine learning literature. Um, I can go into it in more detail, but effectively the higher number, the better. And what we see is pretty high performance across the board with the exception of illustrations, which are a bit lower. There are a couple of reasons for this. One, illustrations, there's just a sort of relative paucity in the training data based on the Beyond Words crowdsourcing workflow. But moreover, illustrations are actually the most commonly confused or easily confused class. So based on the way microfilming is done, sometimes by eye, it's even difficult to tell the difference between a photo or an illustration. And uh, moreover, you know, the distinction between an illustration or a comic or cartoon um, to the average uh, annotator might also be um, a bit sort of uh, you know, porous. So um, with that, let me go ahead and turn to, uh, if my computer will cooperate, uh, a slideshow. So um, I'll go ahead and flag that I'm switching over to a, a quick video. Okay, so perfect. So in this video, I'm just showing some examples of um, some held out pages. So um, pages that were not seen during training fed to this machine learning model after it's been trained to give a sense of its performance. In the top left corner of these bounding boxes, you'll see the prediction class along with the confidence score from the model. And what we see is this plays is that it actually does you know, a remarkably good job of identifying say headlines, segmenting out individual advertisements, um, preserving full comic strips. There's certainly cases where it misses bounding boxes or the bounding boxes might be redundant, but by and large, really seeing some initial versions of this training and seeing the results was I think a pretty, pretty big inflection point in the project's development, realizing that the resulting um, data that was coming back out was actually really usable and could help to support research and, and search more generally. And so I provide this just because I think it gives a bit more intuition than just the raw metrics that I had shown previously. So with that, I'm going to return to the slide deck.
So with that, let me go ahead and talk about the general pipeline for getting Newspaper Navigator to work at scale. So the idea here was for a given Chronicling America page, we can use the uh, existing API to grab the physical scan and then the corresponding, that's Alto OCR. Once we have this, we can run this visual content recognition model, as I've shown. We can then crop and save out all the relevant visual content. We can go into the extracted o or the OCR and extract the relevant textual captions. We can then generate what are known as image embeddings. And so these are um, effectively machine learning generated representations of images that are you know, hundreds of numbers concatenated together that sort of capture the semantics of the images, which I'll describe in a little bit. Um, but then we can go ahead and save all of this. And so now this gives us a closed loop for processing one page. And so we were able to get this to work at scale. And so in total, I processed about 16.368 million Chronicling America pages. At the time, this was about 99.998% of the available pages. Um, in total, this was about 100 terabytes of image and XML data. Um, in terms of actually getting this to run, one of the interesting things about the project was you know, actually running the inference or predicting with this model was much more costly than training it. Um, but in total, this took about 19 days across uh, eight GPUs and 96 CPU cores. So uh, a lot of the code development, I would say, was trying to figure out the right jobs or sort of uh, multi-processing to get this thing to work in parallel. Um, but all this was written in Python and PyTorch, and um, this is also available in the, the GitHub repo for the project. I think one of the sort of initial questions that we all might have is how many photographs were identified, illustrations, et cetera. And one of the sort of counterintuitive things about this machine learning generated data set is that the number of things or the cardinality is actually a bit uh, sort of ill-posed because these are predictions, they're not sort of gold labels. And so what we actually have to use are the confidence scores coming back from the model, telling us how likely the model thinks it is that a bounding box corresponds to a specific class. And so here I'm actually showing three different cuts on this quote unquote confidence score. You can imagine cutting at 90% is a bit stringent, but it's enforcing things that are most likely to be of the class. Whereas the cutoff point 50% uh, is a bit more permissive. So we're effectively tuning between the right trade-off of false positives and false negatives which might depend on our, you know, one's uh, specific use case, what they would like. Um, but I just raised this just to say that the numbers fluctuate, but in total, we're looking at about tens of millions of headlines and ads, but still millions or hundreds of thousands of photos, illustrations, maps, et cetera. So I think that gives us at least some sense of the scale. I do wanna just very quickly show some summary visualizations. Um, so here, what I'm doing is showing the number of photos, illustrations, maps, et cetera, per page appearing on a Chronicling America collection from uh, 1850 to 1950. Note that each individual subplot here is normalized differently, so keep that in mind. And also you'll see three lines in each one of these subplots. These correspond to those cuts of 50%, 70%, and 90%. And so I do also want to say, you know, this is not intended to give us some sort of comprehensive history of newspaper publishing. Chronicling America has its own sort of selection criteria for newspapers. This machine learning model is, you know, not perfect. But nonetheless, we see things that agree with our intuition. Photographs don't really start appearing in the collection until 1900 or so. We see a steady increase of headlines and ads from about 1850 to 1900 or so. I do also wanna mention though, that this metric might not be the perfect one. Um, in effect, we might be less interested in, you know, the number of photographs um, so much as we're interested in like the size of the photograph or the relative attention on the page. So we can instead look at the average fraction of page covered by each one of these different types of visual content. And so here, what we're seeing is that, um, bear in mind, once again, they're normalized differently, but headlines we see are taking up almost 5% of the page by 1920. Advertisements are taking up about a third of the page by uh, 1920 or so. And so I think these just sort of confirm some general sort of summary statistics related to the data set. I think it's always fun though, of course, to actually look at the extracted visual content. Here I'm showing all of the maps identified from 1861 to 1865. And the idea here is um, Chronicling America supports this really rich in, in endeavor called uh, Teaching with Primary Sources, where they effectively have a bunch of topic pages for different uh, topics in Chronicling America and support the teaching of this topic through pages in the collection. Um, for Maps of the Civil War, one of the challenges was how to actually find a, a, a representative collection. And so with Newspaper Navigator, this problem that used to be restricted to sort of manually searching over all of the pages from those years, we can instead just do a quick query, say, let's look at all the maps from 1861 to 1865, and we get a, uh, a visualization such as this one. 
And um, if we zoom in, we'll find that pretty much all of these are maps of the US Civil War. Um, and if we zoom in, we'll see actually some of these maps appearing many times. This isn't because the model identified them redundantly, rather this is actually because these newspapers would reprint the same visual content or same maps um, on different days or across different titles. And so here we can think very much of the viral text project and think about this sort of network structure emerging, but not from the textual content here actually from the maps or the visual content. Um, I do also wanna say though, you know, we can get the sense of the kinds of questions we might begin to explore with this subset, um, including these questions around the, the networks of newspapers, questions surrounding the history of cartography, of course, for scholarships surrounding the civil war as well. Let me just briefly, before moving on to the next phase, introduce just some resources for the project. So if you're interested in using the data set, you can find it at news-navigator.labs.loc.gov. And here you can find instructions for how to query the data set according to a number of different modes. So this includes HTTPS and S3 requests, if you're interested in computing against the collection. Um, and to really, I think, try to lower the, the barrier to entry with Newspaper Navigator, we made uh, hundreds of what we call prepackaged data sets making it possible for any year from 1850 to 1950 and any type of visual content to punch in a quick uh, URL change. And then you can get say all the maps from 1871 or all the photos from 1922 in a zip download and then grab metadata in spreadsheet or, or JSON format. Um, in the GitHub repo for the project, we also have all of the training data or fine tuning data, I should say, um, all of these tutorials for how to use the uh, newspaper navigator you know, visual content recognition model or the pipeline for processing. And these are in the form of notebooks. Um, uh, the model is also in layout parser, as I had mentioned. And then very lastly, I just wanted to include a pointer to the this sort of technical paper that we published on this, um, which we presented at uh, Conference on Information Knowledge and Management um, 2020, CIKM 2020 for short. And so if you're interested in the technical details, this goes into a bit more depth. Um, and I'll mention that we were fortunate enough to be named the best resource paper runner up at CIKM 2020. And also the data set was named best uh, digital humanities data set at the 2020 DH Awards. Um, in terms of the reuse possibilities, I think one of the aspects that LC Labs and I are perhaps most proud of is that the entire project is in the public domain. Um, of course, this is really just, uh, I think, per the Library of Congress's broader mission as the United States' national library, but the full data set can be reused however you would like. And also the code for the project is fully in the public domain. And so one of the things we've been eager to do is track reuse of not just the data set, and search application that I'll show, but also of the code itself. Um, I have a slide here just describing how you query for the data sets. I'll go ahead and, and move forward though. Um, I did wanna mention that in um, May of last year, we hosted a data jam to release the data set. And so here we uh, had originally intended to be in person, moved over to WebEx, um, but had about 180 participants um, show up and experiment with the data set. Um, and it was really fun, I think, to see the kinds of possibilities that people were exploring, even in a you know, short time frame, visualizing tens of thousands of photos, making Jupyter notebooks for querying the data set, um, making really cool collages. And so this began to give us a sense of the reuse possibilities. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and oh, there's a recording of this available if you're interested. Um, but let me go ahead and switch to the second phase of the project, which was once we have all this visual content, how do we reimagine searching over it? And in particular, you know, the data set has these kinds of download functionalities, but what we were really interested in was some sort of interface for exploring the data set. And so we, uh, I ended up creating uh, a search user interface for about one and a half million photos from the data set. These are all the photos from 1900 to 1963 um, with a confidence score of above 90%. And so in addition to supporting keyword search, this uh, application also empowers users to train what I call AI navigators to retrieve visually similar content, with the idea being here that we can actually borrow um, from some machine learning, um, interactive machine learning methods to effectively expose machine learning training to the user and have them effectively work with the system to retrieve visual content of interest to them. And training and predicting on all one and a half million photos can be done in a couple of seconds. Um, I recognize, though, that talking about it probably is less informative than actually showing a demo. So what I'll do for the next couple of minutes here is just walk through an example of using the search application. So if you visit news-navigator.labs.loc.gov slash search, you'll find this full search application. We have a little demo video that goes into a bit more detail of some of the functionality or affordances in the search application. But let me go ahead and just start with a, a keyword search. So here we have very basic metadata facets, including uh, you know, state or territory in which 
the newspaper has been uh, published, the start year or end year, but then we can also do a keyword search. So here I'm searching for baseball. And so what we find returned are about, I believe uh, like 55,000 uh, or so examples. And so these are all of the images um, whose captions contain the phrase baseball. And so of course, this is against the OCR extracted captions. So we're missing a whole bunch of examples because of OCR mistranscriptions or whatnot, but still we're getting about 5,400 examples. And I think this begins to show us just the power of basic keyword search, but also one of the challenges, right? So we're finding all sorts of examples. We have these kinds of portrait shots. We have these team shots, shots of stadiums, action poses. And so then the question becomes, if I, as a historian, am interested in studying you know, specific kinds of visual motifs, how do I go about doing this? And so let's say I'm interested in specifically these kinds of action shots. So I might go ahead and click on these images um, just to, to note them for myself. And I will also mention here, just uh, for a, a brief explanation of the kinds of things you can do, you click info on any one of the photos, it'll bring up a modal with uh, the caption and context, as well as the date published, the newspaper title. And um, you can then also um, click to download the image using IIIF. You can view the full issue. So this will bring you to the Chronicling America page for that, um, for that newspaper title. Here we can see the image in context if we click. Um, then we can also learn more about the title or generate a citation. But then once I've selected all these examples, I can go to this tab called My Collection. And so here I've effectively collected um, my newspaper photos of baseball players sort of throwing baseballs or batting, things like that. And um, uh, one nice thing here is that you can download the metadata. This will give you a spreadsheet of all of these images along with metadata. Um, but I'll also mention that you can click this button called save, which will copy uh, the URL to your clipboard. Um, one of the aspects of preserving policy, uh, privacy that's in the Library of Congress's policy is that we really collect no sort of identifiable user data. So all the, you know, there's nothing about you know, specific individuals use patterns, um, but rather, we uh, do everything through the query string or the URL. So the nice part of that is if I send it to a friend, they can actually view my library or I can save this link and return to it later as a way of building up my library of photos. But with that, let me go ahead and turn to what I had mentioned in terms of this sort of AI functionality. So then we can go to this tab called Train My AI Navigators. And so here this brings up uh, sort of interactive machine learning interface. And so the idea here is we have this example on the left and on the right, we see the examples that are considered most visually similar to the example on the left um, as, used, as found using those image embeddings that I had mentioned. So effectively, we've sort of comparing these systems across visual or these images across visual similarity. And so what we can see is there's some example of baseball players, but also some examples we wouldn't expect, you know, the skeleton, a uh, man in a suit, um, you know, et cetera. And so what we can do is uh, name this AI navigator, so I'll call it baseball players. And we can begin to add the examples that we think are relevant and put a, a minus sign for the ones that seem irrelevant. And so I can also go here on the right and add these other examples. And now when I click this button, train my AI navigator, the system is effectively going to take all of these examples on the top and try to find ones like this, and then try to avoid the examples like the ones on the bottom. So when I click train, it's now going to retrieve um, examples. So this is actually, first um, training a machine learning algorithm, then re-ranking all of the one and a half million examples and surfacing them on the right. And just after one iteration, we see even more examples of baseball players here, right? Like this huge cluster. Um, and I, in the interest of time, won't continue with the training, but we can do this for multiple iterations. Then lastly, we can go back to the search page and then actually apply this AI navigator for similar to a facet to re-rank everything. And then we can begin to do more complex queries. So we can take this baseball players facet, re-rank everything, and then filter by keyword. So for example, if I'm interested in players from the New York Yankees, I might be interested in typing in Yankees. Um, and then this will retrieve the most baseball player-like images whose caption contain the phrase Yankees. To put this a little less uh, sort of uh, uh, opaquely, hopefully this will retrieve examples of players on the Yankees. And let's see if it worked. Um, Sorry, this part takes a little bit as it does the, the multiple layers of the search query. Um, but if we go ahead and click info, here we're seeing manager Huggins of the Yankees. And if we look through, we'll see many of these examples are players on the Yankees. And it begins to tell us how we can you know, formulate these more complex queries. So with that, let me return to the slide deck. Um, and just mention, I think very briefly, how this fits into the sort of broader, I think, oh, well, first, once again, here's the link in a QR code to the, to the search application if you're interested. 
But I do want to you know, turn to this in sort of the more CS oriented language. And so here, this is um, uh, a test bed for what my advisor and I call open faceted search. And so the idea here is that we can draw from human AI interaction and interactive machine learning and try to extend the notion of faceted search, which we all know is great, um, but it requires terms to be predefined, your facet taxonomy to be pre-structured and then applied to your collection in advance. So what we're asking is, can we instead empower users to define their own facets you know, on the fly and use this as an opportunity to actually test scale as well? And so as we've shown, we can get this to work at the scale of one and a half million images. Um, if you're interested in some of the technical details here, we have a demo at WIST 2020, and we have a, you know, a, a very short paper along with some, um, some videos as well. So let me briefly just turn to use cases of Newspaper Navigator that we've seen thus far. And so um, we've seen people such as uh, Daniel Van Strain of the uh, uh, Living with Machines team um, produce a really cool uh, program historian tutorial using the data set um, and released a, a, I mean, a, an incredibly useful toolkit called NNANO or NANO um, for uh, querying the data set more easily and training machine learning models against different classes. Um, we've seen people make visualizations of the visual content um, according to you know, geographic location. Um, we've seen people trade GANs on some of the visual content to sort of create new newspapers. Um, we've seen the maps appear on you know, blogs, such as the afternoon map. Um, I was fortunate to work with uh, Eileen Burson and Michael Burson of the University of South Florida to explore uses of Newspaper Navigator in the classroom. And so um, we published an article on social education exploring this. Um, and here's a link and a QR code. Um, and we've seen the search application be featured on education podcasts, such as the primary source. We've seen a, a large use case of uh, or usage among genealogists. One of the cooler things that we ended up hearing was that someone actually found pictures of their own grandparents in the search application, which is pretty fun. Um, and then less we've looked at the project through the lens of sort of the institutional and operational perspective. And so with uh, LC Labs, um, we wrote an article for European Tech Insight looking at the kinds of sort of uh, interactions or collaborations with the different directorates in the library to make this project possible. Um, and here's a link. And then lastly, I'll mention that we've seen some press coverage as well. And so it's been fun to sort of track reusage and see where the project has ended up. With that, I think I wanna take through the last turn of the project here for the, for the remaining five to 10 minutes and just focus on the, the project from the perspective, I think of you know, humanistic inquiry. And so as we developed Newspaper Navigator, it became increasingly clear to me that one of the important uh, aspects of the project was documenting it, not just from this sort of technical or computational perspective, but really trying to understand the, the sort of, uh, you know, socio-technical implications of this work. And so to do this, I ended up writing what I call a data archeology span where I sort of excavate the data set. And so here I ended up studying um, four different reproductions of the same photo of W.E.B. Du Bois as shown here. Um, these are four photos from Black newspapers in Chronicling America, published in um, October and November of 1910. And so as we look at these photographs, as they sort of move from the physical newspaper page to imaging and OCRing in Chronicling America, to decontextualization in Newspaper Navigator, we begin to see how these different layers actually impact search and discoverability rather profoundly. So one example here, of course, is looking at this cut on confidence score and seeing how it you know, affects the resulting data set. Um, so here, you know, cuts are 70, 90% as opposed to 50% that I just showed. Uh, but even significantly looking at the OCR generated for these specific images, we find that the, the OCR transcriptions and significantly, each one actually contains at least one character level error. So if we were to do a search for W.E.B. Du Bois, without any sort of, you know, um, more careful sort of uh, fuzzy string matching or whatever, we wouldn't be able to retrieve any of them. Then if we sort of further complicate this by instead of using just the bounding box uh, provided by, you know, just from cleaning the OCR manually, but using all of the OCR falling within that bounding box, we find that the captions even degrade further in quality. And this is because some of the actual content of the OCR is being transcribed off the image itself, in this case of the broad axe. Um, and then, you know, lastly, um, sort of using that kind of visual similarity that I had mentioned with um, the training my AI navigators, we find that for visualizing um, these images according to similarity using T-SNE and here are these image embeddings, we find sort of clusters of content like crowds of people or ships in the sea. But then what we find if we look at the images of Du Bois is we find that one of the images is just completely lost from the central cluster. And so what this tells us is that 
even in these cases where we might have not been able to retrieve the image based on the caption, we can't even retrieve it based on these visual similarity metrics and then the question or the methods. And then the question becomes, how does this really impact discoverability or you know, perpetuate unevenness of the historical record, especially because as Lainese Williams has showed, and I think really her uh, incredible scholarship, how microfilming is a, is a form of erasure in its own right and effectively you know, erases people of darker skin tones through these kinds of loss in image quality. Um, so this uh, article is forthcoming in the, the next issue of Digital Humanities Quarterly. Um, and here's a link to a, a preprint as well. Um, now I just want to turn to um, a couple of collaborations with Newspaper Navigator and the Digital Humanities, and then I'll wrap up. So the first collaboration I want to talk about is in collaboration with Jim Casey, Joshua Ortiz Baco, Sarah Salter, and Molly Hardy, which starts to ask the question of how can we use the Newspaper Navigator data set to unpack or see editorial practices? And so, you know, if we see a couple of newspaper front pages, this of the Opelousas Courier from 1872 and um, 1908, we see that the front pages have, of course, changed. But if we isolate any specific year, so here 1907, um, what we find is that there's sort of recurring patterns of visual content on the page. We see headlines tend to appear at the top. We see advertisements appear on this bottom of the strip. There's band on the right. And so this is what's known as the mise en page or the visual layout. And we can actually begin to quantify this using the newspaper navigator data set because we have bounding boxes for all of this visual content. So then we can begin to do things like stack up all of the, the advertisements um, for all the pages on a given year and produce these kinds of heat maps where we can begin to trace the sort of patterns or editorial practices of putting the actual advertisements on the page. And then what we can do from here is not just look at these heat maps, but use them as a way of comparing similarity between newspaper titles. So we can effectively quantify how visually similar newspaper titles are. And so with uh, my collaborators, we've made this effectively constellation of visual layouts of ethnic presses in Chronicling America from 1890 to 1909. So we're taking each newspaper title, splitting it up by year, and then looking effectively at the visual layouts of front pages and comparing them to one another. And we begin to find interesting clusters, such as the one that I've zoomed in on here, where we see um, three black newspapers, the Appeal, the Washington Bee, and the Colored American, all from 1890 to 1900, using a very distinctive style of uh, presenting the front page, namely the sort of title of masthead appearing at the very top, followed by a very prominent illustration in the middle. Um, and here we find that they're actually using very similar kinds of ways, uh, modes of communication. Here, these are actually you know, uh, illustrations or portraits of prominent black members or members of the black communities that these newspapers were publishing in. And so we actually see this kind of shared visual grammar about how the newspapers or ethnic presses are presenting the visual page. So what we're doing next is really trying to explore this at a broader scale and even try to take a look at some of these visual reproduction patterns. Um, and so we're presenting at the Computational Humanities Research Conference next week. Here's a link to our, our paper. Um, and then very lastly, I just wanna to turn to uh, a one last collaboration with um, Devin Nahr, Isaac Alhadef, Professor of uh, Sephardic Studies at the University of Washington. And so uh, Devin has done a ton of work with the, uh, the Ladino text. So here, I just wanna mention that Ladino here is the language of the Sephardic Jewish people, just as Yiddish, the language of the Ashkenazi Jewish people is a hybrid of German and Hebrew. Ladino is a hybrid of Spanish and Hebrew. And um, the University of Washington actually has one of the world's largest collections of digitized um, Ladino materials. And Devin actually has been working to uh, assemble tens of thousands of newspaper pages. And we realized that there was this great intersection between my work with newspapers and his, his scholarship and work on preserving the newspapers themselves. If we zoom in on the pages, what we'll find are effectively Rashi script. So this is, um, you know, if we actually read it out phonetically, it'll sound very much like Spanish. But the sort of tricky thing about this from an OCR perspective is that almost all of the OCR engines off the shelf will transcribe this, thinking it's Hebrew. And so it will actually you know, garble the OCR. And this is a form of what I might call you know, algorithmic marginalization in the sense that OCR engines are, of course, not prioritizing on um, languages such as Ladino. Um, and so that's, I think, a, a separate thread of uh, you know, inquiry. But I do want to mention that Devin and I became interested in asking, you know, how can we try to circumvent this and provide discoverability beyond just doing close readings of scans? And so we decided to focus our attention instead on the visual content here, 
as we can see, there's rich visual culture, and there's been a lot of scholarship on um, Jewish presses, and in particular, um, the Ladino newspapers, and the role of visual content, such as Sarah Stein's work in making Jews modern. And so we were able to process uh, 15,000 Ladino newspapers from across the world, published from 1890 to 1940. And we could begin to take a look at the extracted photographs and not just see sort of examples of community or individuals, but also begin to find you know, these re uh, advertisements that are being published over and over and over. Um, and so here are just some examples in the interest of time. I'm gonna you know, speed it up here, but I do just wanna say that we are able to you know, compare this against some of the scholarship that has been done with the advertisements and actually find some, some broader patterns of this sort of at the macroscopic scale. Um, I'll, I'll end by saying that um, uh, so I have some work forthcoming on this in a, in a book with uh, De Greuter Press, which is called uh, Jewish Studies in the Digital Age, and the, the chapter is forthcoming. Um, with that, I do want to just uh, go ahead and, and uh, make some brief acknowledgments before moving over to the questions phase. Here, I'd first and foremost like to thank um, LC Labs, um, IT Design and Development, and the National Digital Newspaper Program. Really countless people have supported this project at the library and newspaper navigators, of course, the collective work of all of these individuals. Um, I do also really want to highlight the fact that um, you know, Chronic, or Chronicling America and Beyond Words are projects that really are massive endeavors um, that span, you know, in the case of Chronicling America, really decades of infrastructural work and development to get this kind of project up and running. And so Newspaper Navigator, I'm just happy that it's one small part of this really long lineage of newspaper work supported by um, the library. And um, lastly, I want to mention my advisor, Dan Weld, for all of his support, insight, guidance, excitement surrounding the project, um, a number of external collaborators, and just mention that this work is supported by an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, the Library of Congress Innovator in Residence position, and lastly, the Richard and Ina Wilner Memorial Fellowship through the University of Washington's um, Strom Center. Um, so with that, I will just very briefly mention that here's my contact information. If you have any questions, um, please do feel free to follow up individually by email or by Twitter. Um, but I will also go ahead and uh, turn, to, uh, turn to questions here. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you, Ben. Uh, that was really quite a comprehensive overview and it was fascinating to hear about sort of the humanities implications and the implications for historians. I can really see so many historical projects coming out of this and so many ways of approaching this and it really opens up this whole new world <laughs> for newspaper historians, especially to study uh, and to dig into. So that kind of, uh, yeah, that's an amazing aspect of this. And also kind of the way you kind of explained the technical innovations and especially what you talked about the faceted search and how that kind of changes how you can um, yeah interact with the collection um, which was really interesting to me and I, could I actually maybe ask you a question about this first in terms of the sure. faceted search do, do you find I mean obviously it's a difficult question to answer in terms of the lay people who are using this collection uh, do you find that they make a lot of use of the faceted search is that something they deal with, they engage with, or is that, um, is there like big take up on this in terms of refining and thinking about this, or is that more for experts or more advanced users of this kind of program? Sure, that's that's a great question. Thank you, Tessa. I would say that, um, you know, in the, the early days after um, launching the system, we were able to track the examples that people were searching for based on what they were tweeting and things like that. Um, I would say that there was an interesting blend and, you know, uh, hard to tell exactly which were coming from the, uh, you know, the technical experts versus, uh, you know, lay people engaging with the system. But it was really interesting to see the range of things that people were trying to search for. You know, we had a lot of examples of things like buildings or animals and the uh, search, I think, systems, you know, pretty accommodating with those kinds of searches. We did see other people trying to search for things like proper nouns, so for the Eiffel Tower or something of that nature, which system, of course, won't be able to do quite as well with. Um, but I think one of the questions that I'm more broadly interested in with this is doing more user testing and getting a sense from these different user groups, whether it be, you know, historians who are studying visual culture and have very specific kinds of queries, how they're able to use it versus this kind of um, other sort of public engagement component and understanding, one, what are people even interested in searching for visually? And two, what are their, uh, you know, how do their expectations align with reality when they use the system? And so I'd say that in terms of my own sort of dissertation research, one direction that I'm really moving toward here is, 
actually asking that sort of fundamental question of with this kind of machine learning tool, what do people want to search for visually? And um, I think it's it's turning out to be an interesting move toward, I think, a lot of qualitative and informal or informational interviews, but one that I think is, is really fun and exciting and will help to steer the further development of this kind of work. Mm. Thanks. Um, it was also fascinating to hear what you said at the end, this whole aspect of um, the question of erasure, right? And, and bias through the algorithms and everything. And um, it was interesting to see that this is in some ways replicated what we've already seen in, in terms of problems with the textual material and archives and that this is replicated also in the, um, in the visual component of these newspapers and generally archives and how they're kind of accessed and what you can search or can't search and what, um, what's then missing. Could you say a bit more about that? Definitely. No, thank you for, uh, for, yeah, for um, raising this. I would say that one of the challenges in the space, and I guess I would say that I've seen broader discussions around this, you know, not, you know, at various you know, national institutions and cultural heritage institutions as well, is that, you know, how do we effectively, you know, utilize machine learning to improve discoverability, while also understanding the ways in which this does sort of inevitably lead to unevenness in that process um, of the historical record. And I, I guess my sort of takeaway was that with Newspaper Navigator, I think the kinds of search methods that we're providing, I, I stand by and am and, and very, you know, pretty, pretty happy with how they turned out. Um, but I would say that I think one of the takeaways that I had from this, especially when from the examples that I surfaced, was that I think it just reifies the importance of, sort of canonical historical methods, whether it's close reading or whatnot. And it's a reminder that we can't just rely on these kinds of methods. We really do need to be even more principled about understanding data provenance, understanding collections, and really doing that, I think, the, the, the challenging but in, in detailed oriented work of really just excavating individual pages and understanding all of these steps. Um, so that's that. I think that was my main takeaway. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'm going to turn to the questions that I can see coming up on YouTube, sure. because obviously we want to engage our audience. Um, so I'll start perhaps, um, Melody asks, she notes, I think it's interesting that you and many, um, many others use the term keyword searching as a synonym for full text searching. Is that different for you in modern collections? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question in terms of the distinction. I think I typically just use keyword search as a, uh, sort of catch all, as you had mentioned, for just anything where you do some, some very basic, you know, entering of text and seeing what's retrieved. Um, that is a great question about, you know, the usage in comparison to full text search. Um, perhaps one of the reasons why I use keyword search in this context is because with the visual content, the kinds of captions we get back are sort of so fractured and just feel almost like snippets that it seems, I guess, maybe to me, slightly qualitatively different than doing sort of full text search over entire pages. But I recognize that there definitely is a distinction there and one that I think is important. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And Melody also has another question, which I'll take now and then I come to the others. But she is also asking if you think that your training algorithm affected cartoon identification in particular. She notes that cartoon styles change massively after World War One. I. I don't know if you have any comments. Yes. On that. That's, that's a great question. So one of the questions that we had going into the second phase was isolating the collection or the sub collection of the data set that we would use or surface in the search application. And so we ended up choosing the photos for a number of reasons. Um, but I raised this because one of the primary reasons why I chose photos was just because I felt as though, you know, given image recognition and such, we would have the best results if we just used historic photos as opposed to started moving towards cartoons. So I actually have done relatively little work in terms of doing this kind of search or retrieval specifically for editorial cartoons. I will say though that one of the directions that I've sort of begun exploring on the technical side here is generating new image embeddings or fine tuning image embeddings specifically for the task of newspaper photos. And so I just finished running that on historic photos, but hopefully what one can do is then rerun or fine tune um, one of these systems on cartoons as well and see what the end results look like. Um, but I would say that that is definitely one of the, I think, things I might sort of chalk up to a question that I find really interesting and one that I would like to explore, but haven't had a chance to do so yet. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, moving on, we have a question from Albert. Um, he says, really interesting work. Thank you, Ben. 
Does the model give you any notion of how important the image embeddings and the OCR text were for the classification? So he means what way, <clears throat> what way does each have? Yes, so that's a great question. So I assume in this context, it means for the AI navigator in the search application. So here, we're actually not using any of the caption. We're just doing this purely based on the visual content. So there would be there there are methods that we could use to try to generate in effect explanations for the important visual features. So here we sort of get into the the tricky territory of explainable AI and would have to use something like Lime or some sort of approximate way of explaining. But we could effectively try to surface different seg uh, segmented portions of the image and understand how important they were in the classification. And um, I, I think it's a really interesting direction, especially for providing feedback too. You know, a user could get an example and uh, get an explanation back and say, oh, we thought it was, you know, an, an image of, uh, of a skier because we saw snow in the background. And you could actually indicate, no, it's not because of the snow, it's because this isn't correct because it's uh, actively a picture of a polar bear and you click the polar bear, you know, something like that. Um, but I think one of another, you know, another question here is how do we learn jointly over the image and the caption simultaneously? We did not go that route. Definitely an area for interesting exploration, I think, both in terms of the sort of multimodal machine learning component and also with the challenges of OCR being a bit dirty and how do you post-process it or use it to learn from. But um, definitely, I think, a, a really interesting area and I appreciate it, Albert. Yeah, following up on the questions about OCR. There's also a question from Robert Shoemaker. He, he notes it's a fascinating project and he asks you, uh, are there any lessons you can identify from this project for the difficult task of correcting poor quality OCR? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I would say that, you know, one of the, uh, I'd say one of the benefits of having shifted our attention over to the visual content is that I guess I've had to think relatively less around the question of how you actually post-process OCR. I mean, I guess I can give sort of a, a roundabout answer here, which is just maybe stressing the importance of post-processing OCR. One of the big takeaways that I had from the project was understanding that I think oftentimes people say, oh, OCR has gotten better. Why don't we just rerun all these pages and see what comes back out? And I don't think that, I, while I, of course, in spirit, I totally agree. I think in practice, it actually elides one of the real central questions here in cultural heritage, which is, this is not something that can be done for free, right? It requires a lot of labor and enormous computing power to do this. And so I think the answer in a more tractable sense is to not think about re-OCRing things, but really focus on these methods of post-processing OCR because it's less expensive and can be you know, operationalized a little more quickly. Um, I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, some really exciting work out in this space. Um, here, I would drop some pointers to, I believe, like venues such as um, the, the Com Computational Humanities Research Conference, um, some of the ML conferences, and um, ICDAR as well. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not fully up to date on this, and you might certainly be more up to date. Um, but just to drop a pointer and say that it seems like there's really been quite a bit of improvement in OCR post-processing and honestly, something that I wanted to experiment with, with improving the captions, but just uh, never ended up getting around to doing, but I think I probably should, so. So you're saying we shouldn't re-digitize and do it all over, but just work on the post-processing part of things? I think so. I mean, I guess it's uh, the one of the, yeah, the perspective that I might bring is, you know, in an ideal world, we would re-digitize everything, but just given the sort of time, time and, and cost constraints, it seems like investing in better OCR post-processing seems like a really, uh, uh, I think, probably the sort of tractable way forward in my mind. So all just to say that I think the stakes there are, are, are high and, and definitely very worthwhile. Mm. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, James, one of our uh, digital history conveners, he also notes uh, some great stuff. Ben, thanks. Now that you've spent so much time deforming these newspapers, which is what you're doing, right? He says, yeah. I wonder what you make of them as primary sources, kind of now that you disassembled them and deconstructed them. <laughs> yes. If you go back to the original project, uh, product uh, source. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, it certainly is the case that at the end result of Newspaper Navigator, we have these highly decontextualized elements that have been <laughs> cropped and clipped and transmuted in all sorts of ways. Um, and I think one of my favorite parts of the search application isn't the, even the AI portions or anything as fancy as that. It's just taking an image and going back to the original page and seeing how much else is there and all the context that's being lost. I think for me, maybe the, the biggest answer, maybe the biggest takeaway has been collaborating with periodical scholars and just understanding how 
complex and um, sort of quirky newspapers are as sources and how sort of in, um, I would say not just um, sort of rich the individual elements are, but sort of how much conversation there is between editors and understanding reprinting and all of these kinds of reproductions or network elements and everything. And I guess I just say all of that to say that, you know, newspaper research, I think in particular is just absolutely fascinating and being able to dive into some of the scholarships surrounding, you know, the history of print and newspapers in particular, I think is just a, a really fun area to go and endlessly interesting. So I think at the end of the day, Maybe I like uh, I like looking at the the full pages just as much as I like looking at the segmented content too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think James followed that up also and is asking. Um, he's asking how deforming these newspapers teases out for you their differences compared to what we think a newspaper is based on the contemporary idea of a newspaper. Uh, and how? Oh, sorry, <laughs> not to cut you off, Tessa. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's an excellent point, and one of the points that I think my collaborators and I have sort of reached is that looking at these individual constituent po components that are coming back out, I think are a reminder of the sort of editorial practices that are embedded within and almost thinking of them as these kinds of visual collages or assemblages of individual constituent elements and understanding the sort of art that emerges from that, I think is really interesting. And I think it's also a reminder in a sense that the physical newspaper page, um, you know, on the one hand is or the newspaper title might be the broader way that we index it or refer to it as a constituent unit. But in reality, it almost seems like it's this sort of elaborate hierarchy of individual atomic units. And I actually think that that kind of complexity that we see, whether it's through say viral text, which I think is really formative and understanding my view and oceanic exchanges, of course, um, is I think really sort of formative in all of this. But I guess understanding the sort of complexity of the newspaper beyond just the materiality of the page is what's really interesting to me. And so perhaps seeing all these decontextualized elements is a reminder of how much these newspapers are in conversation with one another or building on these or building blocks of these elements. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, I just have one final question before I know we have to wrap up, but just for one final one, and I know it takes us a bit <laughs> off topic here, but well, not really, but you kind of, of, obviously this is a project that's kind of um, publicly available and it should be, but I, I just wonder, I, I imagine that you must have had also commercial interest, <laughs> right, from people, I mean, in terms of exploiting this, uh, sort of, if you're saying you had people who recognize their own grandparents and so on, genealogists and so on, this must be a goldmine too for um, commercially available um, search machines and so on. And uh, so I was wondering if there's anything that has happened there, if you want to talk about that. But yeah, I'm no, definitely, just... happy to. Um, I mean, I guess what I would say is that I, I very much, you know, uh, you know, not to not to become trite here or anything. I do honestly believe in the Library of Congress's mission and the work in chronicling America. And so I honestly think it's one of the parts of the project that I am, you know, quite happy with is the fact that all this is fully available in the public domain. It's nobody's specific IP. And I think that's the that's the way it should be with a project like this. And um, I think, you know, to whatever extent it can be commercialized, you know, I think there are a lot of opportunities, but also I think in my book, making it as open as possible is the best thing we can do for the, the broader community, whether it's through scholarship or public access or genealogy. And so making these tools available, I think also for me, maybe also speak to some of the broader questions we have surrounding proprietary search or open search. And I like to see cultural heritage maybe as an opportunity for us to reimagine or rethink the idea of proprietary search. And not to say that Newspaper Navigator has solved this by any means, but rather is maybe just one example in sort of the, the way in which cultural heritage can provide this space to, to reimagine these kinds of systems in a very open way, not just to be audited, but also in terms of sharing IP and um, making things available. And so I think I, I have the LC to, to thank for that perspective. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah, um, that was really fascinating. It gave us really, I think, lots of ideas of kind of images to look at and new ways to study these newspapers. So this was really an, an eye opener. So um, many thanks again. And thanks to all the people who asked questions in the YouTube chat. Um, yeah, we hope to see you next time. The next talk will be on the 7th of December uh, and it will be uh, a scholar speaking from Luxembourg. Um, and that will be chaired by James Baker. So we'll see you hopefully uh, on the 7th of December. Um, thank you very much. Thank you all so much.